Hi, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Gulf Coast Research Laboratory Science Cafe. I'm Joyce Shaw. I'm the librarian at the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory and the host of this event. Uh, if you're not, we on Facebook, uh, we ask you to like our page. We have a GCRL Science Cafe Facebook page and also our Marine Education Center folks. They have a Facebook page, too. And all of our science cafes that we've been doing virtually and hybrid like this are archived on their, uh, their Facebook page. So, and this is our 11th year bringing informal science programming to, the, to Ocean Springs and beyond. And I wanna thank our sponsor, Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant for their continuing support. And I always like to give a big hug and a thank you to our team at the Marine Education Center. Uh, that's being led by Dr. Jessica Kassler, who are responsible for our Zoom and for this evening, the beautiful space that we're, we're in. Um, our Marine Education Center is welcoming visitors again. This is the advertisement for them. <laughs> this award-winning facility is designed with nature in mind and located in an upland forest adjacent to Davis Bayou. Individuals may walk through the exhibit hall and on the trails during regular business hours. And for tonight's program, if you have any questions, please put them in your Zoom, in your Zoom uh, comments chat, uh, and we'll be monitoring that. So if you have any questions or we'll have any comments for this evening. And I'm, I'm honored this evening to host this very special Science Cafe. We're honoring and paying a tribute to Dr. Robin Overstreet, who passed away in late May of this year. And not only was Dr. Overstreet an internationally recognized scientist, he and his wife, Kim, were longtime supporters of the GCRL Science Cafe. They came to almost every one of them until their health uh, made it where they, they really couldn't come anymore. And so tonight we have uh, a look, a tribute honoring Dr. Overstreet. It's being led by Dr. William Hawkins. He's a retired director of the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory. And I'm going to give a little bit of bio about all of our presenters this evening. And we'll start with Dr. Hawkins. And Dr. Hawkins has a BS degree from Mississippi State University and a master's and PhD from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. He's held teaching positions in the State University of Utrecht of the Netherlands and the University of South Alabama School of Medicine. He served on the scientific staff of the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory, then faculty in the Department of Coastal Sciences of the University of Southern Mississippi, retiring in 2011 as GCRL director with over 35 years of total service. His research interests were generally in the field of marine pathology, specifically carcinogenesis and cancer in fish, and as an administrator, he, saw, he oversaw GCRL's recovery from Hurricane Katrina and the development of the Cedar Point campus, which is where we are sited right now. And in March 20, oh, I like to throw this in. In March 2012, Dr. Hawkins presented a GCRL Science Cafe. If you do the Science Cafe, you get a shout out for me about it. Uh, and on the topic of science and the marine environment, what are the questions, what are the answers? Also joining him this evening is Dr. Reg Blaylock, who has a business in biology from Wake Forest University, a master's from the University of Texas at El Paso, and a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Alberta. And I will tell you, when he showed up, I thought he was a Canadian, but apparently he's not. <laughs> I, I really did. I was like, oh, our first Canadian. No. He's, he's like not from, he's not from Canada. But anyway, but that was, that was We've been here about the same length of time, which is why I can joke with him like that. Uh, he came to GCRL in 1996, and see, I came in 1995, so that's why I say we've pretty much been here at the same time. On a postdoctoral fellowship in parasitology, obviously, under Dr. Overstreet was his mentor in this situation. Uh, he became a GCRL assistant research scientist in 1999, was appointed assistant director of the Thad Cochran Aquaculture Center. In 2017, he was promoted to research professor, which we could go into a long detail of how the university does all of this, but we won't tonight. That'll be another <coughs> science cafe. Uh, <laughs> he became interim director at the Thad Cochran Aquaculture Center in 2022. And his research focuses on all aspects of aquaculture, including 
uh, epidemiology, marine pathogens, and optimization of culture protocols for marine organisms. Administratively, he works to develop agriculture programs at the Aquaculture Center to facilitate growth and sustainable domestic marine aquaculture industry, which is something that is really important that they do here. I have watched them do that now for almost 27 years. Dr. Jeff Lotz is, our, is another one of our friends, that, as a friend of Dr. Overstreet's. He is a professor emeritus in the Department of Coastal Sciences. And from 2003 through 2016, he was chairman of the Department of Coastal Sciences. In 2006 to 2016, he was director of the Thad Cochran <coughs> Marine Aquaculture Center. He has his doctorate in zoology from Louisiana State University and did a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in, in, in immunology at Indiana State. His primary research areas are ecology and epidemiology of parasites and disease of marine organisms, marine aquaculture, and marine stock enhancement. And he has been the co-investigator or principal investigator on research grants in aquaculture and fishery science that have generated over, I think this is $20 million. And he has authored or co-authored over 100 uh, professional publications. And he directed graduate research for eight students has, uh, who earned PhDs and 15 who have earned master's degrees. Whew, another one that I've been around a long time. He was chair of the library committee for many, many years. And I became, I really felt like that I had a good supporter <laughs> when that was happening. So I'm uh, grateful to see him here also co-presented, co-PI with Dr. Overstreet on many projects and grants. We also have, um, let's see, now we're gonna, Marie is here and I'm going to look here and she said she thinks she holds the record as his longest employee. So that is definitely, <laughs> and she worked at, here at the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory for over 25 years and he was her immediate supervisor, Dr. Overstreet was her immediate supervisor for 15 of the 25 plus years. And she worked in histotechnology and biotech and was a biotechnologist in parasitology. She worked with Dr. Hawkins, with Dr. Lotz for the remainder of her time at GCRL as she managed the crustacean disease molecular lab. And she holds an associate degree in medical technology, a B bachelor's in public health, and a master's in public health administration. She credits Dr. Overstreet as a tough boss at times, but she feels truly grateful for the opportunity to have been mentored by such a great mind. Gosh, Marie, that's so sweet. This, I just read that, so it's very <laughs> sweet. Who have I left out here? We now have Mr. Ogle, John Ogle, who's, I will also say, been one of my most favorite library users in the last few months. He is retired from the research lab, having served, served as a senior research technician for over 30 years. He received his bachelor's and master's from Texas A&M University with graduate work done at Texas A&M's Marine Laboratory in Galveston. At GCRL, he was involved with the development of oyster, hatch uh, oyster hatchery, development of a shrimp hatchery, and grow out and development of a red snapper hatchery. And his claim to Dr. Overstreet is to develop the relationship as retired people that they developed after they retired and became such very good friends. And finally, Dr. Anders here. Michael Anders, who received his PhD from the University of Southern Mississippi in 2015 and has been an assistant research professor in coastal sciences since 2020. He came to GCRL as a PhD student in, in 2008 to study taxonomy and systematics of parasitic worms and studied under Dr. Overstreet. In February 2017, here's another shout out, he presented <laughs> the GCRL Science Cafe entitled The Science of Beer, which was really one of the <laughs> most popular science cafes. <laughs> there were many people who thought that there would be samples, but we didn't have samples. So I think it's because he's a brewmaster. And he also did one for us very recently, uh, I think it was January, on sturgeon, on our pastoral sturgeon and our sturgeon program. Whew. All right, here we go. Now I'll get back to my piece of paper here. We have everyone who would like to share a personal memory of Dr. Overstreet is invited to do so following our comments by our speakers here. And if you're on Zoom, go ahead and put your comments in the uh, chat and we have people watching that and we'll be able to uh, pull those uh, comments out. 
I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hawkins, I got everybody introduced. Huh. I'm going to sit down. Thank you so much, all of you, and all of you for being here. Ben, thank you, Josh, for putting this together. It's very, very appropriate time, I think. Uh, if you're looking for something that was organized, that was about it. That's about, it. <laughs> That's about all the organization you'll see tonight. I want to thank uh, Robin's son, Brian, over the street, who made it over here from Upper uh, Mobile County. Now, I apologize for being late. I haven't lived in Mississippi in about 35 years. It's grown so much. Uh, yeah, so we, we thank you uh, for being here. Um, Robin was a multi-faceted person, and I mean, you're going to see and hear a lot of that tonight. I've already changed and decided not to say some of the things I was going to say. <laughs> Early on, I'm sure it will come out uh, at some point, but you get the sense from the, the bios of, of the panelists, his impacts on, uh, on GCRL. Uh, you know, people that, that work with him, people that work uh, for him, people that study under him, and uh, he, he made he made a, a, a lot of a lot of contributions there. Um, if you look for uh, prominent Mississippi scientists, um, I actually Googled it. I, I think that's pretty wise. <laughs> um, but it includes uh, Gordon Gunner, who's effectively the first director of Gulf Coast Research Laboratory and, and had uh, worldwide impact on, on marine science. It would include Arthur Guyton, whose medical physiology book is literally used around, around the world um, and subsequent editions he, he passed a few years ago. It would include uh, Shelby Timms uh, from USM, who literally established an, an, an industry in, in Mississippi and, and made uh, USM a top 10 and a, a very important field of science partner of uh, chemistry. And I think you'd have to include uh, Rob as well. Uh, we're not going to go, some of these things would get. Uh, could get pretty academic and, and go over someone's CV. Well, if you've ever seen Robin's curriculum vitae, it's, it's like a phone book. Uh, I think, what was it, 300 publications? That, that's incredible. It, it, I mean, for, for any, anybody. Uh, you'd have to look at people who just spent all of their time in the laboratory to, to produce that much, but that wasn't all uh, he produced. He had impacts on, on a number of fields, and you'll hear uh, about that uh, from people who know more about that than, than certainly uh, I do. But uh, it was something that struck me about uh, Robin. In, in our field, a lot of, uh, I guess, value sometimes is placed on people who are perfectionists and workaholics. It's a badge of honor that now I work 80 hours a week and all this. And they're nuts. You know, in a lot of ways. Uh, and I'm a perfectionist. I'm never satisfied. No. <laughs> uh, probably after some beers or something. I told the over things to get down honest. I said, damn, you hard work with. But you never satisfied. You, you know, just one thing, you, never, you know, you write a paper with him, you go through God, 20 editions and all. And uh, he said, no, I'm not. I, 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 I let so much get by. <laughs> so in that sense, I would contend that perfectionists, true perfectionists, don't know their perfections. It's just their standards. And the other thing is, is work. You know how hard you work. I said, right, well, you know, give it up. You know, this, this, oh man, I played tennis all Sunday morning. You know, I did this. I went out with the kids and all that. So uh, he, he, he got a lot done. Uh, in, in his time, and we, we're all we're all better for it. So I don't we really we we really, <laughs> like I say the organization. We really haven't talked about um, as you know what what people would or should say. I know them well enough. If I if I told them, they wouldn't have done it <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, so uh, who wants to go first, uh, Reg or Jeff? 
Hey, Bill, can I get a review? Yeah. University came out about two months ago where they said that Elsevier uh, had done a survey on the top 1% of scientists in the world. Yeah. And Robin was up there. Really? Yeah, I was not surprised. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, all the medical doctors are like number one, but in terms of, you know, they had hundreds of metrics they used, and he was definitely up there. Top yeah, 1% yeah, that, that's in the world. Good. It was 2.9 million people listed for wow. the top 1%. Wow. I freaked out. Yeah. Around the world, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> really well connected. That's one way to become a really good scientist is to have these connections. Networking, like he did that. It's Russia, it's Australia, it's Czechoslovakia, Mexico, various places. But uh, I want to talk about his relationship with me and how he helped me professionally. Uh, I first heard about Robin when I was a graduate student at LSU. And I was taking a course in tropical parasitology. It was offered to the Organization of Tropical Studies in Costa Rica. There was a guy there who ran it. His name was Dan Pence. He was from the medical school at Texas Tech University. And he, he had been a postdoc with Robin at two of them. And he said, you know, since you're at you know, so you ought to go over to Gulf Coast Research Laboratory next summer and take that course of parasitology. Because Robin's not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody had a sense that he would go wherever he wanted. Well, wherever he wanted was here. And he stayed here for 40 years, whatever it was. But he was an extremely loyal person. If you'd like to, he'd like to forever. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I did take that course and I took it the next day. It would have been 1976. It actually precedes the photograph that's, a, that's in this little brochure. And I came over here and there were six people in the course. And I remember a couple. Of One of them was, was uh, Dan Brooks, who was a graduate student, who went on to be a very well known in parasitology and evolution. Biology and uh, Tom Beardo, as you know, a few other people, but there were two two uh, individuals who TA the course. One of them was Tom Mattis, who was up at C. The other was Moby Salon, who runs the IMR. He was a graduate student back then, and it was a great course. It really was one of the best courses I ever took. He taught. In the morning, it was for six weeks. And in the morning, he talked straight from 8 o'clock until noon. And then we did lab. And I have two notebooks full of the notes that I took then. And I still refer to it because it's all the stuff that was about lean parasitology here on the Gulf Coast, much of which still has not been published, but it's stuff that he wrote. Well, he got me. Sometime later, I was drifting around in liberal arts colleges, and I ran into him at the American Society of Parasitology in Denver. And he was looking for somebody to replace a co-principal investigator on a shrimp project that they had just gotten. And uh, I said, no, I'm going to Okay, we'll see. He called me about uh, three, four months later and said, I want to offer you time. I was in a small school. I said, you know, so I came here. So he not only got me started or really mentored me in parasitology, but he got me not my first job, but my last job, which is second. So that was one. He was a he was a terrific friend and a terrific, as we said, knowledgeable. He got me invited to a meeting in Europe, and it was the Federation of European parasitologists or something like that. It's the fourth one. I gave it. They talked. It wasn't really I got invited because he asked them to invite me so that I could look at it. But yes, it was in Parma, Italy. And there was another fellow there was a parasitologist with his name, Dylan Perna, who's who's from Israel. And uh, Dylan was really interested. We walked around Parma. He wanted to go see Parma. Italy, he wanted to go see the Roman ruins, which I guess it was Sydney. In Italy, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. We were walking down the street, the three of them, and Ilan has a big beard. He's got coveralls, jeans. He refers to himself as a leftist. 
And as any of you know, Robin, Definitely not. <laughs> Matter of fact, I think that he traces all of the hills of the United States to Jimmy <laughs> But anyway, those two guys who were so different politically talked incessantly about parasites and got along famously and published papers together. And so he was, his politics didn't define who he was or what he was, but he was certainly. Uh, I learned so much parasitology from him and so much about science generally. Of course, we worked quite a bit on various projects, particularly the shrimp project, which was an earmark to help develop uh, shrimp aquaculture in the United States. And he was definitely one of the early people to do invertebrate pathology, that's pathology of things other than dogs, cats, and people but on insects in terms of the starting manifestations. And he was one of the leading people who early on in invertebrate technology. And uh, we worked together, published many papers together, and we had great ideas. And so I'm going to stop there again. So I'm not saying that. Well, I guess it's my turn. Um, I would, um, and I have to mirror many of the things you have said. I, uh, I had seen uh, Bob at many meetings, uh, but about the time that I was getting close to finishing my PhD and thinking, well, what the heck am I going to do? Uh, I met, uh, I talked to, uh, uh, to Bob at the American Society of Parasitologists meeting in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and it was a minor little conversation of, of what you got going on, you want to know what I was interested in doing, and so forth. And the next thing I knew, I was moving to Ocean Springs. Uh, and uh, I figured. But yeah, I'll be here a couple of years uh, and uh, then be somewhere else. But I, you know, I just, uh, it was such uh, an exciting place to work. Uh, something, a new challenge every day. Uh, and just to see his excitement uh, uh, at, at uh, things that, that that he didn't know. Uh, he was interested in, 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 in knowing. Uh, so, um, you know, it's been a great opportunity and, um, you know, developed great relationships here and, and, and very happy to have spent uh, the time that I've spent here. Uh, but Bill asked me to uh, comment a little bit about, uh, a little bit about his impact on uh, marine parasitology. And, you know, we talked about not wanting to, to um, we talked about the CV and the details in there, but you kind of have to think about those gory details a little bit to really understand the, the, the impact of that. Um, you know, just to say that we had 350 publications, that's impressive. But the fact that if you go through and do a count, there's only about 50 of those, of those publications that are not directly on a parasite. Banging a parasite, studying a parasite, is something about them. only about 50 those publications are not directly parasitological. And then if you count general fish diseases and such, pathology uh, in, in that, uh, then there's even fewer than that. So he really uh, spent his career uh, drilling down in what's a very limited field 
compared to uh, uh, compared to what a lot of other people do. Uh, he described uh, at least 112 species. Now that's hard to get a count on because some of his publications contain several descriptions, and I just went through his CV and counted up the ones that that that, that I could directly enumerate. And that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, and and it covers those descriptions cover virtually every taxonomic group. You know, one thing about you know, scientists is we tend to specialize, and we know a lot about a limited number of things. But to say that you know, published on almost every taxonomic group that has parasites in it, that's quite a statement. So he was the, the depth. And the breadth of his knowledge uh, was was phenomenal. And the thing was, and this is this is one of the more remar remarkable things. He was very good at getting money. Uh, he uh, uh, you know, wrote lots of grants, uh, brought in lots of money. And you know, if you count up the grants, there's you know close to a hundred listed on his CV. Do you know how many of those grants mention anything about parasites? <laughs> Less than a quarter of them. So he did all of this parasitology while he was doing other things. So, a lot of the parasites. <laughs> it really is uh, remarkable what he would, uh, uh, what he accomplished, um, and that you know. He was, he was responsible for training uh, a huge number of students, all of them, almost, well, I think he lists 20, over somewhere between 20 and 30 on his CV, uh, that he trained as a major professor. All but two or three of those worked on parasites. And the others worked on some other aspect of, of, of fish health. So remarkable that he was so um, devoted to, uh, to parasites and training, uh, training parasitologists. Uh, and you know, people from all over the world uh, sought him out to be on their, their committees uh, to uh, read their thesis, thesis, evaluate them. Uh, evaluate them. Uh, so, you know, his, uh, his impact, uh, if you go into any uh, uh, laboratory that you know, works on parasitology, and he will almost certainly have worked on one of the parasites that they're working on in that lab, or at least that parasitic group, uh, and they will know they will know who he was. Uh, so his impact on the field uh, is incalculable, and there aren't many people that, uh, are, that can say that. Uh, they're so well known and so embedded in. I, I can't, uh, uh, I just can't uh, really, uh, with the appropriate words to express the uh, perspective. Uh, Yeah, then we follow up on, on something mm -hmm. that you mentioned about Robin's contribution to work to learn to pursue marine parasitology. And my most of my interaction really was, was on fish, fish diseases. Robin saw back in, uh, I guess, the mid 80s an RFP coming out of the National Cancer Institute uh, for some 
they're looking at using fish to do some studies to assess the cancer causing potential for drinking water contaminants, actually byproducts of disinfection. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, <laughs> he had absolutely no background in that. And uh, he got me and Bill Walker, toxicologist, and uh, Simon G. Ryan, uh, in this together. And uh, he put together a proposal, most of the on his own. And uh, we learned later from uh, NCI that we outcompeted Stanford Research Institute and Michigan State to get that, that award. And uh, that lasted for a long time. It wasn't funded by the same people, uh, but it was, it was funded continuously, basically, um, the, same, the same project. Um, to, to get that, the final, um, he had to make a presentation to the, the board at NCI that would make the final determination. He literally taught himself analytical chemistry to be conversant because he was dealing with chemists. That's what they were going to want to talk about. For God's sakes, I couldn't have done, done that. But um, he, <laughs> he, 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 did, he, he did that. And that, like I say, that project lasted a long time. He got a lot of mileage, a lot of publications. Uh, um, and, and he also uh, ended up uh, several uh, environmental ecotoxicological studies uh, on behalf of uh, um, uh, some of the paper industry. And he, he was, he, there's a lot of reasons you know you could sell out to being funded by by industry and, and Robert never would have decided for the science and he wants to be for himself. And, and he wanted to say that he was uh, outstanding. Eco uh, toxicology. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it real quick. Uh, uh, in, in our field, then, there was a lot of travel involved. Uh, I don't know how to put it, but a lot of interesting to travel with uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, in a number of ways. Frustrating at times. Uh, what do you want to eat? I don't care. Really, right? What, what do you, I, I, I don't care. Okay, let's go ahead. Damn, that was bad. Who chose it? Never could make it right. Away. And we were invited to a big meeting out in, uh, in Seattle, University of Washington National Fishing State is sponsored it. And of course, we, we, we grew up in Eugene, Oregon. We had a lot of fans out there. Uh, you remember, remember Mel? I didn't know Mel. <laughs> we, we wound up, and I've never been there before, in Eastern Oregon. Absolutely, totally different from what I expected to be with a friend Mel, who lived way out from nowhere, being the closest town from the broker's lumber. That's what he did. He sat there and sold, bought, and sold lumber. He showed up there in the afternoon. And I knew something was up when nobody said, put your luggage in here or something. I said, you didn't see it. <laughs> sure enough, uh, wound up the next morning in a lumber bag. Not, not, not that kind <laughs> <laughs> It was like a barn with a, a natural hot spring. There you go, hot spring. And uh, we had walked and I had to drive to San Francisco the next day. But it was really interesting was, uh, getting back to Rob and me. In the community that was in that bar, we spent the night, and no one would ever guess he was a renowned scientist that would never come across. So, Marie, you're up. Uh, little that I know, when I interviewed there in 1988, that I was interviewed with the world renowned Harris College. Um, Dr. Overstreet needed a histo technologist, and uh, Technologist, there were many, many of him. Was another him looking at the door again. <laughs> but there, there were many uh, wonderful Paris, uh, Paris College grad students. He, he mentored a constellation of uh, grad students 
uh, parasitologists, uh, employees, and students. Um, little did I know on that first day, I came with a um, <coughs> hospital background when he needed a his okay. And um, I learned from him so many things. I was a, um, you had to be a jack of all trades if you work for Dr. Overstreet. You may wear one hat one day as a histotech. The next day you may be in a dark room. Uh, the next day you may be uh, sampling in, um, in a research building. And you learned uh, perfectionism and you, uh, you learned tenacity. And Rich spoke about perfectionism. And if you were lucky, when you turned over your slides to him and stared into the microscope. If you were so lucky to get a hot dog, <laughs> it was a very good day. <laughs> it was a very good day to get a hot dog, which meant you had done well. And you you worked very, very hard to um, to to reach perfectionism, to um, to, to reach that bar because his bar was was high and you wanted your work ethic to be very high. He was a tough boss um, and he made his employees work hard to uh, to have that in his grad student and everybody who met him I think tried to have that same work ethic and because of that you became a, a better employee, a better person and all that uh, worked for him, all that knew him, tried to uh, try to reach that bar. And um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. Um, I'm speaking from the, the employee perspective. Um, I think everybody speaks from a different perspective here. And uh, I work with a team of great people. If you came to work at the lab, Rich spoke about this. It was a uh, an interesting place to work. You got to work with grad students from all over the world. There was a running joke here that sometimes the gate at the lab was meant to keep us in. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was just a, a great place because you got to meet people from different countries. And not only were we mentoring them, um, I went on to be able to manage to work for these great minds as well. And on this side too. Um, and not only did I learn from all of them in academia, but when when students, grad students, and um, postdocs, they came from other countries, we learned from them and we shared ideas. And what a great place to be able to to share those ideas. We learned from them and they learned from us. And it was just a, uh, an exciting place to work. And Dr. Overstreet, every day almost was a new question. And he just had this eagerness. And um, if you didn't get a hot dog, sometimes it was, it, it was tough, you know, and you just, you, it made you work harder to try to reach that goal. I'm going to share a couple of uh, funny stories. Um, one was um, he worked so hard that he, um, he, he had some um, eccentricity when we would travel for work. Um, for work, I went on a, um, a a meeting one time to Louisiana, and he said, "You're going to see these crawfish mounds on the side of the road." I was going to a, a work meeting with Raina Kroll, and he said, uh, "I want you to take an ice chest and collect crawfish, and then you're going to keep these crawfish in your room. I want you to keep these crawfish." <laughs> In the room, you're going to bring them back and we're going to feed them. <laughs> we're going to feed them. And so that was just the way his mind worked. It was always on science and we're going to use this. When you get back, we're going to use this for a new experiment. So that was one. And um, so he was always thinking about the next experiment, the next goal, what we're going to be working on. And so he may even want to be thinking about the, the next experiment down the line and how to be a better person. So. If anybody out there who's watching on Facebook Live, if you were a student, if you were a, a staff member, if you're an employee, you have anything nice to share about Dr. Overstreet? <laughs> when you said that he did things strangely, he, one of the things that I didn't actually visualize, I see this, but it's horrible. 
He's in Russia, I believe. He's a Larval tape. Everybody knows this. <laughs> I Phil Font. It 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 it. Phil Font was, uh, was in this picture over here. Uh, he was traveling with Overstreet and was staying in a hotel. And Overstreet came into the bathroom. There was a lot of emotion. <laughs> and the door blew. Look at this! <laughs> and he had a huge pile of tape. Go back to the first of it. How it all. Ooh, that one he's not known the whole story. That's not the one he he, he smuggled. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Smuggled. Yeah. 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 But I thought it was that. Yeah. yeah. He's worked on all kinds of uh, parasites from all over the world, and you know the the U.S. government doesn't like to believe in non-indigenous animals. <laughs> uh, so. Bob got around that by infecting himself with the tape one. Uh, so he was the only one that he <laughs> ate, <laughs> ate, he ate, he ate a piece of fish with this, the, what we call the first circle, a, 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 a tape one. I, I think it's toast. Was it toast? I think so. Okay, put it on, put it on toast. <laughs> 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 Forgotten by the docs. <laughs> and um, um, infected himself uh, so that he could uh, uh, then collect the, the parasite and study it. Tell him who collected it. Uh, yes. Well, uh, <laughs> Rita <laughs> Cole. Rita Cole uh, is the one that had to, uh, had to collect it from uh, the specimen. <laughs> <laughs> It's very delicately put. <laughs> but I understand the first, it, you know, some of us remember tapeworms used to be actually administered for weight loss. Mm -hmm. Eat a tapeworm, lose a lot of weight, kill a tapeworm. Anyway, he passed the first one. So I, I, heard, I heard your story too, which is real, very fun. Uh, in a meeting in Toronto, and he was with someone who mentioned Tom Deuter once on another student. Obvious, and uh, it started happening when they had ordered a cab, and uh, of course he wasn't going to miss that opportunity <laughs> just because of the cab fare. And uh, <laughs> you know, so he was waiting, waiting. The cab was down there. The cab says, "What's going on? We're waiting for this cab. What's he doing?" He really, really <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't want it. Don't want it <laughs> But it was just normal for people in the lab to oh Jesus, that's another one. What was the one you had to put the urine on? Well, that's a little bit. That's a little bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was on that, that trip we were out in the Pacific Northwest. We went to some national park and there was a fish and rat tail or something like that. Might have had some parasite that was unique. Robin didn't have a knife or anything, so I, I swear, he literally, I had a picture of this, I, I probably lost it. Dug into a garbage disposal unit to find a beer can that he could tear apart to use the end to cut open this fish to get the parasite out. And then use the leftover beer to preserve it. We took the damn thing for the rest of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of came back and studied uh, uh, some, somehow. Um, being a student under Robin was an experience, I'm pretty sure. And there have been some very uh, unique individuals to, to, to complete that. And I, not saying Michael is one, but <laughs> some of his brothers in academia uh, and sisters. Uh, yeah, I guess I, that means I'm going next. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I came here in 2008. I was looking to um, complete my undergrad, wanted to work with a parasitologist and reached out to a large ish number of them interviewed at two spots and um, it was a really weird interview here um, uh, for two reasons and I, I've used one of them 
already uh, in recruiting a student. The first that was weird is he spoke at me as if I had already accepted the position and was laying out what my prospectus was going to be. And it was very odd <laughs> um, that, that the interview started that way. Um, and the next thing he did that was great is uh, he got me out on the water collecting um, United clams with, uh, with a postdoc at the time, Steve Kern, who was also one of the students. And it was a great tool because I was able to get out on the Pascagoula right away. So as soon as I was in the water, not prepared to go sampling, so I was, you know, wearing slacks, but, you know, getting muddy in the water, it was, it, it felt like a good fit for me. I, I don't dress nicely most of the time. So um, that recruiting tool I, I've now used with the, the first student that I brought on, took him out immediately onto the Pascagoula, a few you know, about 20 river kilometers south of there, but catching gold sturgeon. And I, it's it's very useful. I think it's a great teaching tool and a great recruiting tool that, that, that you know, I, one positive thing for sure that I pulled from him um, is, is those types of interactions. Um, but once I started, you know, I, don't, I was not prepared for um, Robin Overstreet, the, uh, the advisor. Um, I was, one of the first students at USM to go from, uh, uh, or at least in our, our department, to go from um, a bachelor's degree to a, to a PhD program. Uh, he didn't treat me any different than, than anyone else who would come in with a master's degree. So um, I got here. We basically had already laid out my prospectus in our first visit, and I started working through it. And then he was largely um, aloof and gone through the first year and let me figure out how to be a student, how to manage my own time, um, which I probably did poorly. Uh, and it was very odd because I sort of, you know, you, you expect to get this great training when you come as a student. Um, but what he, what he did that you don't realize at the time until later is he, he really allowed the other members of the lab to do most of the training, um, to give me the experience of interacting with those that, have, that are a little bit ahead, um, I came after Katrina, by all accounts, prior to Katrina, he was much more hot-tempered. I, I caught the more um, mild-tempered version of him. Um, <laughs> but uh, but what, was, what was really interesting is, is the, the ability to work on so many different things at one time that were unrelated to your project. Uh, I think it... Probably, you know, I don't know if Ash or Steve are listening or others are listening. I, I think part of that is based on the way that, that he was trained. He was trained in a very broad way where you were expected to figure out problems on your own, um, where you sought advice from others that were even outside the university most of the time, not within your own department. And so I think a lot of his mentor styles sort of derive from that. You seek out the opportunity and you sort of make your own luck. Um, he was incredibly difficult to get a darn uh, manuscript to and back from. Uh, his turnover time was very slow, and when it came back, it was basically just bleeding red ink for all the wrongs that you've committed. And I, you know, I felt really bad initially as a student until I'd seen some of uh, you know, his, uh, his collaborators who were well on, and it was no different, most of the time, maybe probably a little bit less. but. Um, but it was a very interesting experience. I, it also seemed, you know, from sort of, I guess, the recency bias of me, he, he took on students sort of in pairs, which is now something that I've started to try to do as well. I can come in at relatively um, short intervals so that they're sort of co-training each other and you have that knowledge that gets transferred down. Um, but it also seemed in some ways that he'd almost pit the two students against each other, um, at least slightly for, for bits of competition that um, I don't think was um, meant to be nefarious in any way, but really to, to get the, both, the, the best out of, out of those people. So um, as, a, as a trainee, one of the things that irritated me the most <laughs> is uh, how good he was at, at, at respecting his craft as a parasitologist. So Reb spoke on all the different taxes that he worked on. It's, it's astounding that in the mail one day, you're, you're getting you know, fixed fish, 
And the next day, you've, you've got a slew of spiders that are coming in for, for nematodes to come out. Um, sometimes when, when people send fish, they, they, um, they don't send it packaged well and you get rotting things that you're then expected to go through uh, to find whatever the trouble was before, which was annoying. But the real annoying thing was um, there are a lot of folks out there that suffer from, from um, either real or, or perceived infections of a, of a parasite kind that um, will <laughs> that will seek out uh, the expertise of any parasitologist if it's listed on your profile at all who's willing to respond um, and and he responded almost all of the time he never missed an opportunity <laughs> <laughs> and so you you get nose boogers random hairs uh, <laughs> strings random I mean, the one is, uh, he was on the phone he said man I am not a parasite <laughs> <laughs> but but I think it's also something to be respectful of. I mean, he, he took it serious for those that, that felt like their voices weren't being taken serious with their own physicians. So, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I mean, I, I have nothing more to contribute to this amazingness as a student or as a as a student as a as a mentor um, in that. He did work on a variety of different problems. Anything that was that was tricky, he was working on. Um, almost everything he was working on. So if you wanted to collaborate with him, he was there. Um, although sometimes it set that boundary up that that's a problem he's got in his wheelhouse, not yours. Um, he took an offer to staff too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where's I going? Oh, his. How, how broad he was. What, what's astounding is that one of my students now is working on um, movements of a variety of different fish species. And uh, a lot of the literature that he's finding related to the diets or the life history of those fish were actually published by, by Rob. And so um, it's cool for me to get the feedback from, from students that I have now, where it's like, this is not even a parasite problem. And yet he's there, he's the name. That, that I recognize too. So, yeah. What he offered his graduate students too, from my perspective, what, although academically it's a very small environment here, you know, you can't go to another building and find experts and, and everything. But his students would, 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 by the time they graduated, would have a record of accomplishment that made it look like they'd already had a postdoc or even a Assistant professors with how, how many publications did Ash have when he graduated? Well, not much. <laughs> <laughs> he can't be up there. In more yeah. ways than one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 but he Glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but <laughs> the environment that he fostered was, was outstanding because there was always a visiting scientist from somewhere else that was using one of the labs, 137, as a base for a lot of examinations. And, different taxa and it was, you know, um, in, in the time that I was there, it was maybe only um, eight or nine that had come through. Um, but the amount, because he worked on so many different problems, the exposure that we could have to those variety of problems helped make us a more well-rounded uh, biologist, not just a, a specialized person, but certainly not a specialist in anything. So. Jack Walter. Yeah. He'd be doing blood smears or electron microscopy or sampling in the field. And that exposure to a little bit of everything and the scientists who were using Lab 137 as a base gave you um, a little bit of knowledge in those areas. And it was exciting to be able to have that exposure. Then the was head of public information at the lab for a long time. I, I told her about this and she said she couldn't come. Uh, she sent something said, I, I'll read what she sent. Early one morning, shortly I, after I had signed on with the Gulf Coast Research Laboratory, I saw Robin Overstreet in the hall outside his lab. He was surrounded by researchers and students. It was definitely not a morning social gathering. Um, the focus was intense, naturally. 
I paused and observed. Old Street led the way. He mapped out the day's work. Um, the mixture of personality, some with grace and humor, but all with passion about the work had me hooked. Uh, thank you, Robin, for her introduction to me. So, John Oak. Uh, when, when Dr. Overstreet went into the hospital uh, the last time, I called Bill and told him that he should uh, probably go by visiting. And like everybody said, that he was he had to see uh, things to do. And, uh, so Dr. Overstreet died May 22nd at the last 10 30 on a Saturday night. And since I didn't have wasn't in contact with any of these people. I thought I just I waited till Sunday morning to uh, to call Bill. I figured he would have uh, be able to put it online and tell everybody. And uh, so I called Bill and told him that uh, Bob had died last night. And there was a pause, and then Bill said, "I am so glad that I went by to see him on Friday." <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, I came to the lab about five years after uh, Dr. Overstreet, and in the, uh, to the best of my ability, I avoided him for the entire 40 years that I worked the lab. <laughs> he was, of course, very focused, as you heard, very serious, and very unapproachable. So I probably only, uh, and he had a reputation, uh, <laughs> I probably only interacted with him maybe six times in those 40 years. I remember one of the uh, one of the first times that I, I went to him, I went to the library to get a, looking for a copy of the Fish Culture Manual. And I told him that, well, Dr. Overstreet probably had a copy. So I went to his office and he was in Kent on his computer screen and I looked up and I uh, told him what I was looking for. And he didn't even get up, he turned in his chair and simply pulled it out of a stack of uh, power and <laughs> stack of publications and he told me to sign the, uh, the sheet on the door. So I turned to thank him, and he was already back looking at his uh, his computer screens. <laughs> but after I retired, uh, I drew out to lunch. I, I ran into uh, Dr. Overstreet, Richard Hurd, and uh, Gene at uh, Mikey's on the bike. They invited me to sit down with them. So after some trepidation, I sat down and I actually survived. <laughs> so uh, the following week, I, I ran into him again. So then it became a routine. So we had lunch. We had lunch together for uh, twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays for eleven years. And, uh, the uh, we had some real open and, and free discussions. And, uh, so a different view of him from, from what we've heard. Uh, he was a Gemini, so there was basically two of him. <laughs> <laughs> One that you've heard about, so referred to as Doctor Overstreet. And uh, very serious and very focused and kind of one dimensional. He was uh, known as Robin to some of his, to his colleagues that he spent time with at the lab. But uh, people outside the lab all knew him as Bob. Uh, so I got to know Bob Overstreet, and he actually had an amazing life story. As a child, he had polio, and they didn't think he would ever walk. But he recovered. And, and in high school, he, uh, you know, which is also why I, I kind of think he. Love tennis so much later in life. Uh, he repaired car transmissions in his parents' garage, mostly I think the ones that uh, they destroyed in their street racing. But I don't know. So uh, he was worked as a carpenter, a roofer, and he worked on a dude ranch. Uh, one of the people who owned the property next door was Ken Kesey. Uh, one of Bob's good friends ended up driving the magic bus. Uh, so he ran around with a, a group of uh, people in, in Ornament in high school. And, uh, he would tell tell stories. Uh, you know, I guess they were you could call them misfits and malcontents. And, uh, there were stories of uh, bar fights and uh, cross street races and uh, bikers. And uh, this guy Mel always seems to be in the uh, <laughs> center character in all of his stories. I mailed. Mel's one of my favorite people. He, he was a character also. Yeah, so he always seems to be the center of these stories. And so uh, some of these stories he would tell. I, so I finally one day, since I, after a while, I, I actually would surprise myself with some of the things I would ask him. I'd never consider asking Dr. Overstreet. 
but you know, Bob and I had some very uh, very open discussions. So I said, ask him one day, so you were basically a juvenile delinquent growing up. And he said, yes, I was. And he said, uh, he told me that he felt like if he hadn't joined the Navy, he would have spent, ended up spending most of his life in prison. He joined the Navy, he was a, a radar operator on a icebreaker in the, uh, in the Army, but then he, uh, when he got out, he went to college in Oregon, majored in business, and then he switched to advertising, and then uh, finally biology. As a uh, growing up in high school, he had, a, he had an aquarium. And, uh, periodically, the water would turn brown and the fish would die. And so he, he went to the library to, to read up. So he read up everything he could read on, on aquaria, aquaria keeping and water quality and eventually uh, leading to diseases and parasites. And he never did figure out why his fish kept dying. Uh, he ended up going to the University of Miami on a, on a fellowship. He was, he was uh, offered a position in a couple of schools, but he chose the University of Miami. They offered a fellowship, and uh, he was the only applicant that had been in the uh, military, so they accepted him. He was, he was in the biology department under uh, Gilbert Voss, the head of the department at the University of Miami. So he went to Boston asking for some uh, some lab space, and uh, Voss told him, no, the, the biology lab is only for invertebrates. So Bob mentioned that, well, parasites are invertebrates. Boss told him, no, it's only only invertebrates are collected by the Gerda, which is their name, ship. So uh, he went to uh, Iverson, who was actually his major professor. He was actually in the fisheries department. So Iverson got in some space in the fisheries department uh, with Bill Odom, with Bill Odom's lab. And then they, when Odom uh, left, they, they moved him over to the Sarno's lab. And then uh, one day they came in and told him to, uh, he had to clean out the lab by that evening. Because they had a, uh, they got converted to a C14 lab for a researcher that was coming in, and uh, so he moved over to the biochemistry lab. And, uh, then later they moved him over to the, uh, the geology building. So he got his master's in '66 and his PhD in '68, and then he spent a year postdoc at Tulane, and then he came to the GCRL in 1970. I came here in 75, about five years after. But uh, so, in, in the time I spent with him, lunches twice a week, and uh, found out that he really wasn't as one dimensional as, as you kind of portrayed here. He also had a lot of other interests. Uh, he collected coins, he collected stamps, he was a member of the Gulf Coast Stamp Collectors Association, he was a member of the Gulfport Pistol Club. Uh, he still loved hot rods and uh, had three of them. He cruised the coast with them. He'd always uh, make sure that he took each one to every venue and got his card stamped and, uh, and uh, a decal for, for each car. He would always take off a day and go to Mardi Gras every year. And he also took an annual trip for a week up to Oregon every year. You can see it's the, uh, the Eric is son up there. He would attend his high school graduation, his high school uh, reunion. There were about 350 people that were in his high school class. He could always attend that. And then he would go out to Summer Lake and uh, shoot birds and post up the parasites. So he had, a, he had a complete series. I don't know how long he did that, 20, 30 years. So he had a complete set. And that was one of his, his major goals was to, uh, was to try to get all of that worked up and written. And then um, with the, uh, the group, the, the gang that he hung around with in high school, they would all go up to uh, to a cabin that Mel had up this little little creek and spend the weekend. So they had to get there by canoe, so they'd all bring something to eat, paddle up there and spend the weekend. And uh, there's only four bunks, so Bob would sleep out outside on the porch. So later on, uh, the uh, when I was after a few, a couple of years ago, I was cleaning out my stuff and uh, I was getting rid of my reprints and my books and uh, I ran across that fish culture manual that I borrowed from. <laughs> <laughs> and so Bob was retired then, but he was still working at the lab. And so I made a special point of taking that into him, uh, personally handing it to him 
And I told him, you know, now I borrowed this uh, a couple of days ago, a little while ago, and I wanted to uh, make sure that you got it back, that you knew that I brought it back to you. Of course, it had been 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other thing that, uh, back to the lab that Bob was, uh, he was obsessed with space invaders. <laughs> now, if you, uh, if someone happened to walk into his lab and uh, innocently comment on what a nice lab he had, then he was immediately on the defensive. And if that person made the mistake of mentioning how big it was or, uh, or how much space was there, then he went to full paranoia. <laughs> so uh, I asked him one time if, uh, if it's uh, being paranoid about, uh, about people taking his space away from it was related to his time in Miami when he kept losing all of his space. And uh, he told me, well, he had never really thought about it. And it never occurred to him, but uh, I might be right. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Bob was always right. <laughs> At least he was never wrong. <laughs> and uh, whether in fact or, uh, or by default, no one was going to, uh, to argue with him. But uh, I, I had a thought one, one day, actually at night, most of my thoughts come to me at night, that uh, the truth is actually time dependent and observer based. And there's a certain amount of variability associated, which would probably be quantified. And it depends too on the, your point of view and the, uh, the observer bias. So in our discussions over, over lunches, uh, a lot of times they would we'd be talking about something and I would just pop up and say, well, that, that don't sound right. <laughs> that can't be right. And uh, so if Gene was with us, he'd always ask her to pull out her phone and uh, ask Siri. <laughs> <laughs> he was usually right, but um, and sometimes uh, Siri didn't have a clue what we were talking about. And then sometimes there was within that variability, uh, the standard deviation of the truth, uh, we could both be right. <laughs> and occasionally he would actually admit that I was wrong. And uh, so the first time that happened, I told him, you know, that, uh, said, can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> said, no, I'm not saying it again. And, uh, <clears throat> next time I said, well, wait a minute, back it up. Let me uh, give you some paper. You can write that down and sign it and date it. I want to witness. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the, uh, Anyway, so one, uh, one uh, I guess it was Thanksgiving, what, uh, uh, Thanksgiving uh, two years ago, we were, we were eating at the palace, and it was, uh, I don't know if y'all know, I eat out all the time, but all the restaurants close uh, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And so I started going there to eat. And, uh, originally, there was nobody, nobody there, but now it's kind of popular. Everybody's discovered the secret. It's, you know, it's easy food and no bus and no bus. And so there's whole families that go there now. And so whoever uh, doesn't have any place to go, they usually go with me and we go there. And actually, uh, so Bob started going with me. And actually, Cam went with us several times while she was alive. And so uh, it was about almost two years ago now. Been two years since Thanksgiving, we were over there. And so Kathy was there and Jean and Brian was there with us. And uh, we were talking about something innocuous. I think it was, uh, why do they call them quarter horses? And uh, Bob started off on this, this involved description or talk about how it was because of the gate and they have a, a one in four step. And said, no, that ain't right. Uh, it's because they run a quarter mile track. And he said, you know, you're right. <laughs> and, uh, so I popped off again and I said, oh, so, so back it up here. So if I'm right, does that mean that you're wrong? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm wrong. And Brian's head popped up off the <laughs> And he said, you know, that in, uh, what did you say in my entire life? That is the first time I've ever heard my father admit that he was wrong to anybody. <laughs> so, anyway, so... Uh, the library now, uh, Joyce has been going through uh, all of Bob's reprints and uh, books and calling out the duplicates. And so I was over at the library the other day. And she's been putting them out on the table in the Taylor building for anybody that wants any. And so I was walking by there, and, I, and there was that fish culture man. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to pick it up, and I, I plan to give it back to him the next time I see <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever bring it up? Something 
and get in a, let's say, a discussion with Bob, he would uh, invoke the past on the end. And we some of the students would say, you know, Bob remembers things in the past clearly, whether they ever happened or not. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate y'all inviting me here this evening. Growing up, I thought uh, that every kid had done dolphin knock neck crossings when they were four or five years old. <laughs> and who hadn't gone and lived in Israel and Australia? Just that all seemed pretty normal. And then I guess I it was probably 15 or 16 when I realized Dad was pretty serious because I, I went to St. Martin, but I had to, <laughs> but I, I had to take a uh, driver's ed class in uh, Lindsay High School, and we had to introduce ourselves. And he said, "There's this overstreet that ate the uh, tapeworm." <laughs> <laughs> My dad goes to Czechoslovakia, but you know whose dad doesn't go to Czechoslovakia. <laughs> you know, I, I haven't heard this. This doesn't sound right. I don't know it's right. And, uh, then let's see. I guess it was around '92. I accumulated a couple degrees also none of which was in science. Uh, but I, I found myself stranded here in Mississippi uh, financially for a short period of time. And I uh, wanted to get a job on a boat. And so I called Noah up to get a job as a fisherman. And they said, you're Bob Overstreet's son? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, well, we need some marine biologists. And I said, well, I'm not a marine biologist. Uh, I was just trying to get a job as a deckhand. And they said, well, are, are you sure you don't want the job as a marine biologist? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a marine biologist. I haven't had a class in science since the 10th grade. And uh, they called me one night and they said, hey, can you be on the boat tomorrow morning at 5.30? And I said, well, yes, sir. I said, by the way, what am I going to be doing? And they said, well, you're a marine biologist. <laughs> No, I'm not a marine biologist. And he said, well, if you're on the boat at 5.30 in the morning, you're a marine biologist. <laughs> so I, I told Dad, I was like, Dad, it's fun. <laughs> I got a job as a marine biologist. And he didn't think it was as funny. As <laughs> <laughs> so he drove me up to the lab and gave me a book on oceanography. And he said, you're going to read this book before you open your mouth. <laughs> and uh we steamed for five or six days, and I read the book from beginning to end, and fortunately, since I had everything on the tip of my brain, I didn't, uh, I was fraud. I was definitely a fraud, but uh, I, that I was able to, to do my job while I was out there. Uh, but then I, I went on and accumulated some more degrees, and I've got a lot in common with my dad. I was a little rowdy for a while. And uh, I was also a bit of a perfectionist and a bit of a workaholic. And I probably pushed that too far uh, at some point with the working. And I, I backed off dramatically. And I said, wow, you know, my, for me, my life improved a bit. And I talked to Dad and I said, well, Dad, you know, you ever think about touching the brakes? You know, you're getting older. You don't need to, you don't need to do this. It, and that idea was so foreign to me uh, because, you know, the lab was so important. And, uh, time went by, and we readdressed the possibility of him retiring. And he said, I, I, I'm going to do this. This, is, this keeps me alive. It keeps me happy. And uh, more years went by, and he said, well, I'm retiring from the lab. I said, well, that's, that's fantastic. And he goes, and I have to stay gone for 45 days. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, 
Nobody ever needs to laugh. Yeah. And so he had some state of reemployment that kind of confounded me. But uh, it, it's the end came closer. Uh, I saw his career winding up a bit. We talked about it a little bit more. It, and I asked him, you know, you're, you're retired, but you're still taking on students. People are still bringing manuscripts to the house, and you can't leave the house. You know, and he said that he wanted to make 400. And uh, in, in, in his last days, I didn't realize uh, a lot of his health issues. He hadn't, he hadn't really shared with He said that 350 was good enough. But I, I thank everybody. I will say that during that 45 days that he was away, we got a thesis defense at his house. <laughs> we don't want to put, we'll put that on tape. <laughs> So you all have been talking about the impact that he had in the science world. And I want to tell you, our son Jason and Brian used to play together as little kids, and our families were very close. And one day after Bob had picked up Brian and brought him home, my son Jason said, uh, Dad, I, I'd like to change my name. He said, change your name? Jason was a very strong, he's a good man. He said, no. I want to change my last name to Overstreet. <laughs> <laughs> he gave uh, Jason a job later because Jason did become a very good fisherman. I tried to get Jason a terrible job working in ditches so he maybe had a, a, a stronger interest in, edu in education. And of course, Bob worked against me. They had job, Jason a job fishing. And from Jason's point of view, uh, the state was buying his gasoline and his and his bait, and that's all he really cared about. <laughs> uh, so he was he was happy to see the be for that. And so he and his sidekick uh, Jody Peters, I'm sure you all heard of Jody, used to go fish every day and bring back all that fish for for the students and Bob. And every time they would find one that was just really ugly, gnarly, and had something going on, shouldn't be. They say, ooh, Dr. O is going to love this. Bob and I, I met Rob. I've known him for a few years ago. We were a double team playing tennis. We had some success at the state level and some state championships. Rob would ride to tournaments with me. I was impressed by the I didn't know until now that he was probably conning me. <laughs> but our our team almost didn't come to pass after the first time I did a restaurant. Uh, there were like six of us around the table like this. And I didn't know how good your job was. And neither did our server. <laughs> he had asked her questions and questions and questions. She went back and got the He came back and Bob was asking him about what he was using with the utensils and what the, what Dutch garlic and, and I guess it was a real serious subject. He satisfied the uh, went back and I started asking him questions about that. This and all of that, what does it do, and all that. And uh, after a couple of minutes, he finally got a little serious and looked at me and said, I like to uh, approach Bob from a different angle. We, he came to the land of the sea of in 1970. And, uh, we became good friends, uh, but interested me that he was interested in everything, including geology and the publications I made and so forth. And what astonished me is that the power of creator that almost obscures his face, <laughs> and over his table, 
could see him, and I couldn't understand how anybody was able to do all that work at the same time and find all the papers uh, in that gigantic mountain of publications. Uh, talking about some very sad aspect, but just a few weeks before he died, he called me and asked me whether I want to like to have a subscription to any of the magazines I have been reading. And I, I said yes. And just a, a few weeks after he died, I had the journal. I didn't think that he would have remembered. He was a very generous and kind person, essentially. Bob's uh, concern about garlic is what got us kicked out of Mikey's on the bike. In fact, we had to switch to, uh, to uh, microwaves. Microwaves closed down, we would eat at uh, TJ's at Saki's. When he was, when he was finally confined find to uh, bed, bedroom, basically, I would. I try to stop by about three times a week to bring him a milkshake and either a fish for boy or a, a fushimi from, from Saki. So uh, he would always, uh, they always garnish it with a, an orchid. He'd always eat the orchid. So the, uh, the fruit bowl back there has uh, four orchids, compliments of Saki. The other punchline I forgot to mention was on one of his uh, was and that been his last trip to up the up the creek with Mel and the gang. Um, he uh, before Mel died, uh, said that uh, Mel finally admitted to it that uh, he was the one that had been pouring the beer and the whiskey in his aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he. He avoided garlic pretty well because I don't know, maybe others uh, didn't have a bad yes. reaction to garlic. But that was part of the <laughs> sea of travel. <laughs> <laughs> he had certain things that he liked to do and he said he liked to take a break from Mellow Yellow. Um, and only certain people were allowed into Mellow Yellow breaks. That was his drink of choice with Mellow Yellow. And so I hope he's enjoying Mellow Yellow in Heaven. And he um, he also, like Tim reminded me, um, he liked um, Cowboy Express. Oh, that was the place. Yeah. When I first started here every day, just about every day, launching Cowboy Express. That was one the type place. He used to love the type Well, then yeah. there was yeah. the type place, too. I think that was after Cowboy yeah. Express. Yeah. Uh, the same day. I think Richard got kicked out of Cowboy Express or something. I don't know why they stopped going there. But uh, yeah, then they went to the, to the time place. Yeah. Y'all mentioned how productive he was, how focused he was, and everything. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, as, as a young faculty coming into a department, which was one of the department models, uh, um, evidently involved in, in getting that set up and, and direction and whatnot. And uh, um, I was on the, I guess, lucky, I don't know if that's the word, but on the departmental annual evaluation committee for many years. And it was always like, oh, God, how are we going to keep Overstreet out of the first place? Yeah, the highest <laughs> rank, because it was always just so productive. It was funding, students, teaching, publications. And, and we do these interviews. You know, there's usually three of us in the in person. And, I said, well, Bob, yes, sure. I'm copying you. You got the perfect score. He would just sit there like, like it was supposed to be like a shot, right? <laughs> and, uh, but it was year after year after year after year like that. So, I mean, there's no question. He was clearly the most productive one at the laboratory at the time I was there. But, but Nancy wants me to tell the story a lot. I don't think I should tell it. But um, when I was a relatively new faculty member, a new uh, scientist originally, we would sit at a long table in, in Keller and everybody would be on the table. And, and I remember this one time I was sitting there and I was always opinionated. Didn't say anything, <laughs> always opinionated about things. And it was me and Bruce Cummins was sitting next to me and then it was like somebody else and then Bob. And 
And I said something that he didn't agree with. And all of a sudden, this commotion started, and I couldn't quite see what it was. And, and Bruce looked over like this, and he looked back at me, and he goes, are you talking to me? And I was, I'm talking through you to him! <laughs> and it was that loud. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I don't even know what it was. It was trivial academic stuff. But it was he was so passionate about guiding that department in the direction that he thought was, was, was good. And, and sometimes we had arguments, and some not. And most of the time, I didn't win. <laughs> Smart money would have been on him having a stroke here in one of those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he would get, I remember sometimes walking down the hall and he was chewing out a student in the hallway. It was a finger thing. I'm like, why? Those are early days. We had a visitor from Taiwan, <laughs> Dr. Sun. And Dr. Sun and Robin were all yeah, and, and Dr. Sun. Probably the most difficult person I had dealt with, but somehow we completely went wrong. So, I mean, Robin, one day, Dr. Sun said, Yeah. Yeah. When I got here in 2008, you mentioned that he had, he had done some ecotoxicology for. That's what I was hired to do as an ecotoxicologist. So we took a kind of special interest in my first few years here was always giving me advice and then doing everything. It was always very, very good advice. And so I got into the habit of walking around thinking about an extra proposal or a paper or something, and I would end up in his office sometimes. And he would always say, Joe, what are you, what are you working on? What, what's next? What are you thinking about? And he tells all my ideas. And I mentioned those big, towering stacks of papers you have at his desk. I tell him my ideas were, and he had this little grin on his face to say, that was a good idea. When I had it in 1986, <laughs> I had to pull a paper out of the stack and hand it to me and say, you're going to read this. And at one point I told him, you're the most demoralizing man I've ever spoken to. Every idea I've had, you already had. <laughs> that stack of papers might be all related to this space. Mm -hmm. because yeah. He had boxes that were empty. Oh, yeah. all, oh, I may never, may never, I may have to ship that microscope. So he right. got, so he marked his territory. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Robin, Robin only wanted the space he had and that adjacent to his space. Yeah. <laughs> and other than that, he you, you remember when you were director and I was interim chair for a little while? We were working on space allocation and, and oceanography, and, and that was like. No matter who it was, it was a no no. Nobody wanted to get up stage, right? And I went to the military advice and I said, you know, something like that. And the other just give old street something. <laughs> <laughs> what it is, give them something. So I gave him the old dark room. He made it know. Yeah. Yeah. He said, just give them anything and people won't say a word. No matter what else happened, no, that's probably. Right. That was right. That was great advice. Because yeah, yeah. when I when I told him, I went, oh, oh, good. He's gone. He's like it up already. It was amazing that in that stack that he could find, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. he could find anything that you needed in that stack. And if you rearrange that stack, he would know. He would know that somebody had touched his his tower, his stack. It was usually, yeah. I would have hated to see one of those fall. Yeah. <laughs> that well, I wonder maybe Michael you know better, but you know he had a large parasite collection. I think. Was indexed in his brain. I don't think he wrote much of it down. Yeah. It depends. His, uh, well, it depends. His, his dissertation work was wow. uh, was incredibly <laughs> well indexed. Uh, I was working on a, a species description, and I was trying to borrow some of the specimens from the museum that, that he had described, and uh, I had no clue that any of that was back there. I didn't ask the right questions, I guess. He's like, well, you need to borrow those. And he just went to the back and he handed me a stack of all the other parasites that he never classed into a museum. Um, but it was good enough. It's very no, no, he could find it. Been, no, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. the question was, who's finding it that? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it wasn't just academic <laughs> interest he had in, in, in parasites. I learned through him the economic importance of ecological importance and all that solved a lot of problems. 
seagulls or or, or some birds would die down by the harbor. And everybody thought that, you know, somebody took them out. He looked at the ones and said, they've been electrocuted. <laughs> you were in the pelican, yeah, I think. Or, yeah. And uh, it solved a big problem for, thank you. Some people said he saved the Louisiana catfish industry, identifying uh, some, some parasite. Just killing their crops, um, and then and then that that field that we we, we were in with eco uh, pathology and all, and everybody assumed that uh, all this fish has parasites. It's weakened. It's uh, it's going to die. There's somebody's left some fumes out. So yeah, and he would point out, you know, it's it's the center of the. Of the Ecological realm, it wouldn't have the parasites if there weren't these in the, you know, just very simple stuff that he was able to really articulate uh, clearly to people who were not, were not conversing in this field by the way. If it's interested, I mean, it's one thing to be interested in describing a parasite on the slide, he was interested in the whole life cycle. Not just about the single organism that he was looking He wanted to know everything about the whole life cycle of that person. One of his strengths really was, and this is probably why I didn't take that sentence, one of his strengths was his strength. He could use a microscope. He could see things because it looked so long. And the ducks that were there were. The number of teeth and the number of this and other, and that's why he could do. He had a real challenge. I would disagree that Dad was able to converse with people that were not. He <laughs> 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 spoke a lot of Latin growing up. <laughs> Somebody here mentioned one of you guys mentioned that it's, it's true joy that what he did. Some of my favorite memories of him, you know, is, you know, I do a lot of a lot of histology, mostly reproductive histology, and I would find some unidentified something in one of my slides. And so I'd trot it down the hall to, to show Dr. Overstreet what it was. So I knew he'd be able to identify it. It was he was like a little boy at Christmas. Time. Yeah, and he would he would bring him something and he would just light up. He was so happy to look at whatever this bug was and to figure out what it was, which is which was you know, it's amazing to see a 60-year-old man acting like a five-year-old. <laughs> and he would say, go get some more. <laughs> go get some more. Okay, well, um, anybody have any, any closing comments? I, I really don't. I think we've covered a lot here. I really appreciate, again, Joyce putting this together, the Technology team. Oh, this is a nice place. Most people have to be there. <laughs> and, uh, and Brian, of course, for, for, for coming and our panelists. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 All right. Well, there's. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins, for helping put all this together. We got a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Uh, hey, Rune, question. she wanted to have a comment. She's been on Zoom, and I did tell people on Zoom they could put comments and questions. So she has a comment. I only knew Bob from events on the GCRL campus. Kay worked for uh, Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant for a number of years. Um, when seeing him walk across the campus for Sea Grant business, but she really enjoyed his company. I know he would have retired uh, in the large group in 2011 where she retired, but I'll never forget his remark when someone asked him why he did not retire in that group. And he responded, and then what am I going to do? <laughs> so that sounds exactly right. And she has a question for Michael, which was how long did it take you to go from a bachelor's degree to a PhD under Dr. Overshee? 
six years. Six years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Six yeah. years. Okay. Yeah. Seven years. Seven, seven years. Okay. Seven years. Okay. Well, that's not that. That that. Huh? that yeah. 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 He didn't have a master. Okay. Didn't have a master. Well, uh, I do again thank all of you. Now, I see I never got a chance to say anything about Dr. Rosenstreet. <laughs> and the one thing that always I, I came back to, he, one of his students, you know, because people use the library, and sometimes people say things in libraries that they might not ever say anywhere else. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, but one student had told me that was working in taxonomy that, you know, when Dr. Overstreet was his major professor, um, that his parents didn't seem to understand um, what that was all about. Why, how do you commit your life to basically studying animals? You're, you know, you know, identifying little, I always call them flea on the, flea on the fish and making a living from that. And I said, it's very easy because actually in Genesis 2, the first thing God did was he created the, the animals on, our, on earth and the water and the sea and the sky. And he told man to go name the animals. And I said, go tell your parents that you're doing God's work. <laughs> and he was like, oh. <laughs> I said that to Dr. Overster. He just kind of chuckled later when I talked to him and told him that I had told the student this. But the student came back and said, you know, I told my parents that. That they, I was doing what God told man to do, the first thing that God told man to do, and was name the animals, and that's what I'm doing. And he said, they never ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of think of Dr. Overstreet as being that way, that he was in so many ways kind of called to do what he was doing. I don't know whether what power it was that was doing it. I don't have that much insight into, into spiritual matters at all. But I do think that he knows we're here and that he knows that he was doing God's work in a way on this planet, in a way that touched so many different lives. And how can you not, not have just the utmost of respect for a person doing that. The other thing is, uh, when I was first hired, I found an itsy bitsy little turtle that was probably a, just about this big. It was a very little baby turtle. And Dr. Overstreet was going by, and of course, I'm really excited. Look, I found a turtle. And he looked at it, he goes, hmm, too young to have parasites. <laughs> Probably save that turtle slide. <laughs> but, you know, but that those things are how I, I kind of remember Dr. Overstreet on the 75 boxes that we have to go through that come from his office. But that's another story. We're just grateful that I knew the man. Yeah. Grateful that I knew him. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. 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 Thank you.